Exodus chapter 33, I, I think Mitch may have mentioned, uh, we uh, had a total of three baptized on this campus today and three over at Jackson campus. Can we celebrate that and thank God for that? And then, uh, of course, for the families that joined, we did have two families and three uh, children that we dedicated to the Lord this morning. Uh, you may have noticed lately, I've been hanging out some in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. And I want to go with you to one of my favorite chapters uh, in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, if you have your Bible, we're going to read in just a moment, verses 12 uh, through verse 23. Exodus 33, and let me begin reading in verse number 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. He said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. The Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Isn't that a great passage? This is the word of the Lord. I want to pray with you, and then for a moment I want to preach to you on the subject of God's assignments. God's assignments. God, thank you for this morning. Uh, just a blessing to baptize Jim and Diane. Lord, thank you for bringing them uh, into true faith in Christ. Thank you for Tegan today and the three that are baptized on the other campus. God, you are good and you are gracious, and we celebrate. We celebrate the families that uh, are joining here and the three or four families that are joining over on the other campus today. What a blessing uh, to see uh, a church that's alive and a church that you're blessing. Lord, we... Uh, we're coming today as needy people before you, needing your grace, needing your help. And Lord, uh, knowing that this message today is primarily for the saved, but I know that there might be someone here today that doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior. And I pray that the gospel will be clear, save the sinner that's nearest hell. And I pray that every one of us will be challenged today in this matter of of your assignments for our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. In our Christian journey, uh, we all face a variety of tensions. I'll give you one tension that you lived out this week. Uh, here it is. Will I walk in the Spirit or will I fulfill the cravings of my flesh? How many of you know what that means in the last seven days, right? It's a daily tension. I'll give you another tension. In your walk with Jesus through the years as time goes by, you can look back and see times maybe where you were having to wait on the Lord. You needed an answer for Him. The psalmist said, I waited patiently on the Lord. Maybe 
you were in a season of learning patience. How many of you could use a truckload of that today, a truckload of patience? Maybe things are not happening quite like you want it to or as fast as you'd like to see it happen. At other times, Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. Uh, I know some of you in this room right now, you struggle in your life at being still. And sometimes being still can be uh, frustrating. It can be overwhelming. I was sharing with the first service growing up, I learned the importance of being still because my dad was my barber. And so I didn't go to the barber shop much growing up. Uh, we just pulled a chair out right there in the house. And if I heard him once, I heard him 10,000 times say, son, be still. Uh, when I became a teenager, I learned the importance of being still because I didn't want to wear a ball cap to school, right? I wanted my haircut to look decent. But in your, in your journey of faith, there have been times when you certainly have learned important lessons while God just had you uh, being still. At other times, it's time to go. It's time to move. It's time to act. God's got something that he wants you to do. Maybe you've been in a holding pattern in your spiritual life, and God is saying to you today, you need to get out of that holding pattern because I've got something I want you to do in my kingdom work. There are times when God is moving so clearly and so powerfully, it feels like that you have a hard time keeping up with him. At times in your journey, God wants to move you out of the place you're in, which might be a besetting sin. There may be something you've been struggling with for years uh, to where you feel like you're not being effective in serving the Lord or in kingdom work, and God wants to move you out of that besetting sin into a, a life of power and joy and being spirit-filled and being useful in the kingdom. Maybe you have unfortunately slipped into a season in your life of laziness. You've gotten slothful. You're not as diligent maybe as you were at one time, and God wants to move you into kingdom work. Let me flip that around, if I may, for just a minute. In these years of ministry, I've seen some people that are just too busy. They're too busy in kingdom work, and God wants to move you out of that busyness into a place of balance into a place of rest. There's some of you today that God's got something for you to do. He's called you, he's gifted you, uh, he's enabled you, and he wants to move you out of the comfort zone that you're in because he has a new assignment for you. Exodus chapter 33 is a conversation between God and Moses about the next step in his assignment. The text, of course, is in the setting of the wilderness wanderings. For 430 years, God's people found themselves in Egyptian bondage, and God puts his hand on Moses to lead them out and then to lead them in the promised land. If you've read your Bible, you know that what should have taken about maybe 13 or 14 days turns into 40 years, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now, God gives Moses this assignment. And Moses did exactly what some of us do when God calls or God speaks and tells us something that he wants us to do. He immediately began to wrestle with God about his inadequacy. God, I'm not adequate for this calling. I, I'm not one of great fluent speech. You don't want me uh, going and, and speaking in front of Pharaoh. And of course, we know uh, that's exactly what Moses did because God called him to that assignment, and he used him uh, to speak those powerful words. Now, let me put uh, Exodus 33 in its context. We have just finished up the golden calf debacle, and what a mess that was. Uh, the people of God are there in a holding pattern for about 11 months, waiting patiently. They became very impatient because they felt like Moses was up on the mountain for too long, and somebody got the bright idea to make a golden cat. Moses comes down from the mountain in Exodus 32, uh, verse 25. You see on the screen, it says, Moses saw that the people were out of control because Aaron let them get out of control, and they had become a laughing stock to their enemies. Get the picture? Moses has been with God. The people have seen uh, the lightning. They've heard the thunder. They've heard 
the trumpet of God, that where God is visiting with Moses in such a powerful and holy moment. And then Moses comes down and he finds chaos. And in his frustration, he throws those stone tablets down on the ground. And ultimately, he grinds up that golden calf and he sprinkles it in the water and he makes the people drink it. Moses steps forward. He says, all right, listen up, everybody. If you are on the Lord's side, step forward. And the sons of Levi came forward. And, and after that, there were 3,000 men who were killed that day as an act of judgment. Now, I want you to put yourself in Moses' shoes for just a minute. And I want you to think about God's assignment in his life and everything that's going on in this moment. Moses did exactly what a good leader should do. He begins to pray. He begins to intercede and talk to God. God, please forgive these people. Please, I'm begging you uh, to, to still bless us and guide us. And God responds to Moses by saying, Moses, here's the deal. I'm going to settle this account with them later. But right now, I want you to get up and I want you to go. I want you to get back to the assignment that I have for you. So, so let me for just a minute, as we all personalize this story, let me show you three things in Exodus chapter 33 that we can learn uh, from Moses about his assignment. The first thing is, notice God is speaking. God is speaking. Look at verse number one of chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, now, sometimes we read a phrase like that and we just keep right on going and, and we don't stop and digest the importance of God Almighty, Yahweh, speaking to his people. Notice that he gives Moses direction. Moses, depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I want you to notice that in Moses' assignment, in this moment, God has not gone silent. God is speaking to him. Have you found in your journey of faith that it's a wonderful thing when God speaks to you clearly? When you know, when you know that you have heard a word from God, a word of assurance or a word of direction, how many of you can think back uh, in your spiritual journey at a time or a juncture where you know God spoke to you? I'm not, I'm not talking about audibly, but I'm saying, God, you knew God spoke to you. Wave at me this morning. Let me flip that around for just a second, if I may. How many of you have had junctures in your spiritual life where you needed to hear from God and it just seemed like the heavens were closed up. Where you just felt like, God, where are you? And so I want to remind you today of the sweetness and the blessedness of knowing that God is speaking in your life. Uh, the years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we call them the intertestamental period. It's about 400 years where God goes completely silent. I don't know about you, but that gives me chill bumps. That God is quiet. People ask me today, Pastor, is God still speaking? God spoke to Moses here. Is God still speaking? Sometimes people would say, you know, I'm in a situation in my life. If I could just hear God speak out loud. Anybody ever thought it'd be cool to get a text message or an email from God? God, just make it clear. Speak to me now and i want to remind you today as i often have that if you want to hear god speak out loud you can just open up your bible and read it out loud because the bible is god speaking to us now watch moses is at a very difficult time in his life he's messed up his leadership was not perfect he struck the rock he's broken the tablets in anger and frustration with the people He's just gone through the emotions of the golden calf. He has just seen 3,000 men killed. Just imagine the carnage that he experienced that day. Moses, no doubt, was human just like you and me. And he was thinking, man, I'm the leader of this outfit. 
God, maybe I need to do something else. God, I'm not qualified or God, I'm not doing I'm not doing a very good job. How many of you believe in this moment would be a really good moment for him to, to hear from God? For God to speak to him. God many times speaks to us in our adversity. He speaks to us in difficult times. Sometimes life gets tough, and it's, it's really simply because God wants to have a conversation with us. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, God whispers to us in health and prosperity, but being hard of hearing, we fail to hear God's voice in both. You know, life's trucking along, you're healthy, the bills are paid, you're feeling good about your job, and so forth and so on. Maybe we become dull of hearing to the voice of God. But when God gets us in a difficult moment, He has our attention. C.S. Lewis went on to say, Whereupon God turns up the amplifier by means of suffering, and then His voice booms. God's voice is booming to Moses. He speaks to Moses about His covenantal people. Moses, I have made a covenant with this bunch of knuckle-headed, (laughs) hard-headed, selfish group of people. But Moses, you need to remember, I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to keep my covenant with them. I am going to carry them into the promised land. Church, aren't you glad today that God keeps his word when sometimes we don't? That's a weak amen. I said, God keeps his word. You can trust him today. When he speaks, it will come to pass. The question today is not, is God speaking? The only question we need to answer is, are we listening? God speaking. How many of you are saved today, born again by God's grace? Would you wave at me and say amen? Amen. We should never get over that. If you're a Christian today, it was because God spoke to you. There is a call. You see, salvation is not give Jesus a chance. Salvation is not, I'm going to give this a try and see if it works out. (laughs) No, salvation is a call. Let let me show you in the Bible, can I? 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 9, look at this. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Father called you through the Spirit into koinonia, into a relationship, into fellowship with His Son. If you're saved today, there is a call that came into your life, the call of salvation, the call to believe, the call to repent. It was a call out of darkness into light. Maybe you're here today and you never experienced that call. The book of Hebrews says today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Maybe you're here today, there's never been a time in your life when you have acknowledged, I'm a sinner. What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. It's when you break God's law. Sin is when we rebel and do our own thing and we don't obey God's commands in His Word. The word literally means to miss the mark. Think of the bullseye being perfection and you have no ability to hit the bullseye. You're a sinner. You miss the mark often. And so every person needs a moment in their life when they acknowledge, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Every person needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this a whole bunch around here. Not as a way, a good way, or the best way, but the only way. Jesus Christ is Lord. We must confess our sin and confess Him as Lord. If you're hearing that message today, and the Spirit of God is speaking to you clearly, the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, says the Spirit and the bride say, Come and let him that is thirsty come and drink of the water of life freely. God brought you here today so that you could hear the Macedonian call of salvation come to Christ. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26, and he says, Consider your calling. Consider your calling. Maybe you're here today and you need to consider your calling because you've never been saved. I pray you'll do that today. To those of us that are saved in the room, I want to remind you, you need to consider your calling as well. Because when God brings you into salvation and He calls you to repentance and faith, He does not stop 
speaking to us in our life. There's a call to salvation, but there's also a call to assignment. In recent days, school started back, and all the kids are moaning. What do all the teachers do in the classroom? The teachers give out assignments, right? Oh, how many of you parents know all too well about those assignments? You get off from work, that's what you're working on. You got, you got stuff that you've got to do. Please hear me today, church. God Almighty is handing out assignments. He's got something that He wants you to do. And maybe God sent you here today for you to hear this. Maybe it's time for you to perk up and listen. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the call of God in your life and say yes to his assignment for your life. The second thing I want you to see about Moses' assignment is that in, in your assignment, God is protecting and providing for them. My pastor growing up used to say, where God guides, he provides. How many of you heard that before? Where God leads you to, he's going to make a way. He's going to provide for you on that journey. Look at verse number 2, chapter 33, verse number 2. He sends with him an angel. And God promises to remove the obstacles and the enemies. If you've read the book of Joshua, you know they certainly needed that in the conquests of the land. They needed God's protection and his provision. Moses, I'm sending an angel before you. Now look, this is interesting. This is not the first time God promised an angel. Look on the screen, Exodus 23, verse number 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemy and an adversary to your adversaries. Look at verse 23. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, I will blot them out. Notice God's usage of the phrase, my angel. Look at Exodus 32, verse 34. But now lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. I want you to do a Bible study sometime about God's usage of the phrase, my angel in the Old Testament. There are many scholars who believe that this is a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. So in verse uh, chapter 32, he makes a reference to my angel. But notice something changes in chapter 33. He doesn't say my angel, but rather he says an angel. Now watch, Moses, good news. Time to go, get up. I know things are messy. I know you're confused. I know you're frustrated, but I've made a covenant with my people and I'm going to push through and I'm going to help you move forward. And I want you to know I'm going to send an angel before you as your guardian angel to drive out the enemy. Good news, Moses. You've got a guardian angel. But then God turns around and gives him some really bad news. He says, but I'm not going with you. I mean, you know, those are words you don't want to hear God say. <laughs> we'll send an angel, but I'm not going. Now, now digest that for just a minute, can we? I know it's hot in here. We'll be okay in a minute. We'll be outside where it's cooler. There are three things that happen. There are three things that happen because of the golden calf debacle. Three things. Number one, 3,000 men are killed. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? 3,000? The second thing that happens, I just read it for you. God withholds his full presence and his manifest glory from his people. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. One writer said, God cancels his trip. God Almighty cancels the trip. Moses, you're going forward but I'm 
not going with you. Hear me today, church. You never want God to cancel his trip. Yes, yes, we believe in his omnipresence, but there's something here about his full presence and his full blessings. We see it again. Another punishment in verses 7 through 11 of chapter 33 is that Moses takes a tent and he goes far outside the camp. That is the place he would go and fellowship with God. Once again, the people would be in the camp and they would look out there and they would know the glory and the cloud and the presence of God as Moses would go out to the tent, far outside the camp. Don't miss this. Why was the tent way out there? Do you realize in this moment the first 31 chapters of Exodus are completely put on hold? God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a tabernacle. And that tabernacle is going to be the centerpiece in the camp. We're going to put it right in the middle, and it's going to show forth my presence, my power, my glory, my direction for my people. It's going to be the centerpiece of who you are. But now the tabernacle is put on hold, and God's presence is outside the camp, far outside the camp. In verse number 5, look in your Bible. We actually see that this angel, yes, is a guardian angel, But this angel is also an act of God's mercy. Hear me today. Hear me today. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. But our God is holy and just and righteous. And we read the Old Testament. We don't really really like reading chapters like 33. The world, liberal, progressive Christians, they don't like reading chapter 33 because here's what God said let me tell you the reason why I'm not going with you because if I did I'd kill you so he says I I would your rebellion your stiff neckness your hard-heartedness if I'm right there with you verse 5 God said God said "I, I I would destroy you I remind you today, we do not come to God on His term, on our terms. We come to Him on His term. Amen? You know, we don't, we don't come to Him and demand His favor or demand His blessings. We certainly do not live the way we want to live, act the way we want to act, talk the way we want to talk, and then expect his, uh, his best and His blessings in our life. I love what Moses says in chapter 33 and verse number 13. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you. In order to find favor in your sight, consider, too, that this nation is your people. Here's what Moses says. God, thank you for the angel. But I don't want the angel. I want you. I want you. I want to know you. I want to experience your grace. I want to experience your blessings. I want to have your manifest glory in my life. These are your people. And he said, God, there's something I read in the text. There's something about us that makes us distinct. It is that we are your people and you are with us. Today, may the church not lose that same passion for the manifest presence and the glory of God. God, we can't do this without you. We can't take another step without you. God, show us your ways. We want to know you, and and we want you to speak to us, and we want you to uh, protect us and provide for us. And the last thing I want you to see in the story is I kind of try to tie it all together is that is this moment, God, in this moment, God is challenging them challenging he's challenging Moses I love what Moses says in verse number 12 God okay I'm ready I'm surrendered but I just want to know God who's going with me (laughs) who's going with me we don't know exactly what Moses is referring to here is he talking about Joshua and his role as an assistant but here's what we see it's obvious that Moses does not want to move forward all alone 
I remind you today in the assignment that God gives you in his kingdom and his work, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of a biblical Christian community where we help each other with our assignment. Moses is the leader, but God, I can't, I can't, I can't do this on my own. So God's challenging him. Yes, Moses is the one that lifted up his hands and the Red Sea parted and they walked across on dry land, but he's also the one who struck the rock. And he forfeited his privilege to go into the promised land. At the end of the book, you see him on Mount Nebo where he dies there, and he didn't even get to experience the full blessings of the land flowing with milk and with honey. And, and, and you see in God's conversation with Moses, Moses, I, I, I know that their behavior can be frustrating, and I, and I know that, that, that you get frustrated with yourself and your leadership, but you stay faithful and I will be with you. It's challenging, yes, but it's worth it. When God calls you to an assignment, you can bank on it. It's going to have challenges. It's going to be challenging. But he's with you every step of the way. Amen? Warren Wiersbe said there can be no growth without challenge, and there can be no challenge without change. So not only is Moses challenged, but I want you to see this. Moses makes a point about the people being challenged in this moment. The tent is far outside the camp. Look at verse number 7 of chapter 33, an important statement. Moses used to take the tent, pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of the meeting. Notice this next phrase. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of the meeting, which is outside the camp. Now watch, the tabernacle was going to be a thing of convenience. The tent, not so convenient. Moses said, if you really want God's glory, you really want God's blessing, you really want to know God's ways, you're going to have to go out, you're going to have to make an effort, you're going to have to want to. Anybody in your Christian journey at times ever had your want to broken? Come on now. I mean, you know, today, today there's, there's a lot of people their want to is broke. We're, we're not maybe seeking the Lord. We're not desperate for Him. There has to be effort in our walk with God. We, we seek Him. We desire Him in our assignment. Please hear me. We believe very strongly in the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. The psalmist said, if I ascend to the highest mountain... Or if I go down in the lowest valley, God, you are there. But there is something different between omnipresence and God's manifest glory. Now Moses is in the presence of God. He's having, he's having a conversation with God. And he asks God, God, I want your favor. I want your grace. I'm asking you to teach me your ways. Notice verse number 15 of chapter 33. He said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. We're at Mount Sinai, God. And then this is a mess. There's a lot of things that have happened here. And we've got a journey in front of us. And God, is, as a leader in my assignment, I'm saying to you, I don't want to take one step unless you go with me unless I experience your glory. Verse 17, God says, Moses, I'm going to do this very thing. I'm going with you. You're going to have my favor. I know your name. I know you, Moses. I've crafted you and I've called you for this moment. I love what Wearsby said. He said, God's servants must never use their assignments as temporary stepping stones for something greater. Church, can I remind you today that Moses is right where he's supposed to be in the will of God, fulfilling the assignment that God has for him. And please hear me today. You cannot be promoted above the will of God for your life. You're not trying to climb a ladder in the kingdom. You're just trying to be a servant and do whatever it is that God has called you to do. Hear me today. God has an assignment for your life. You have a choice. Christian, will you listen to his voice? 
will you fulfill that assignment? That assignment is not about your glory. It's about his glory. God says to Moses, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you stand in, in a certain place in the rock. And Moses, I'm going to pass by. And I want you to know, I'll be gracious to whomever I will be gracious. I'll show mercy to whomever I show mercy. I'm going to put my hand over that crevice. And I'm going to pass by. Moses, you're not going to see my face. You're just going to see my back. But you're going to experience the manifest glory of God. Boy, if Christians in the church today could grab Exodus 33. God, show us your ways. Show us your glory. Our lives are all about His glory, not about ours. The assignment that you have, it's not about you. It's about Him for His glory. The El Moody said, let it be God's glory and not our own that we see. And when we get to that point, how speedily the Lord will bless us for His good. So let me finish by saying that God is speaking. God is speaking. If you're not a Christian, we pray today that you'll hear His voice and be saved. Christian, God is speaking, giving out assignments. We're reassured from this passage today that whatever God calls you to, He will he'll clear the path. He'll give you what you need for that assignment. There will be challenges along the way. But God will carry you through those challenges because there is joy and glory in the presence of God. And all God's people said,